morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, session of the Citizen Engagement Festival. My name is Karen Fabry, and I'll be your moderator for, for this session entitled Food Systems in COVID-19 Times, How Citizen Engagement Got Crucial. Um, so uh, I work for DG Research and Innovation, where I'm a deputy head of unit of a unit called Bioeconomy and Food Systems. And I'm here to underline the importance of engaging citizens in this, uh, in this uh, endeavor of transforming food systems, which is now also a key political priority uh, under the uh, Farm to Fork strategy and as part of the European Green Deal. I'd like to mention the work we're doing on our Food 2030 Research and Innovation Policy Framework, where we seek to use research and innovation to really drive food system transformation for co-benefits to nutrition and health, climate and environment, circularity and resource efficiency, and for innovative communities. So my, um, my colleagues in the background, in the back office, are going to make some uh, material available for you that is relevant to, um, to what we're going to be discussing today. But I'd like to mention that this is really a timely moment for citizen engagement. and. Um, there's a number of initiatives that uh, really place it at their core. And as I said, some sources will be put in the chat. In particular, I'd like to mention the new Secretariat General newsletter for policymakers on citizen engagement and the Climate Pact communication that was just adopted two days ago. And it's going to be launched actually at a public event on 16th of December. So I invite you to take part in that because food systems and climate are really linked together. So the objectives of this session is to, are to showcase successful initiatives that have engaged citizens in transforming food systems for sustainability, health and inclusion, and to extract your recommendations together with you to increase the involvement of citizens and in particular of youth and to build capacity and increase citizen engagement in this particular time of crisis. A few housekeeping rules uh, for the smooth running of the session. Uh, we will have five speakers, uh, each of which, which will present their uh, showcase their, their successes in six minute lightning talks. And as participants, you have two ways to provide feedback. One is through the use of Slido, where we've prepared three questions uh, for you to give feedback on. And the, the, uh, the details of Slido will be made available in the chat. And we'll use the code uh, hashtag 17285. The other way to take part is to use the live Q&A available in Zoom. And here you can post comments uh, or questions that uh, will either be analyzed later or will be can be responded to by some of the panelists. So now um, I'd like to introduce our, our distinguished uh, speakers. First, Muki Hakle, who's going to talk about the DITO, so Doing It Together Science Project. Carlo Mango from the Cariplo Factory. Jacqueline Bourse will talk to you about the Fit for Food 2030 project. Teano Musuri will report back on the Big Picnic project. And finally, Christian Buget Henriksen, who's going to talk to us about Food Shift. So I suggest now uh, we, um, we try and open up Slido and insert the code. 17285. I hope that you're all able to access the Slido site. And there's a question there for you, which is, in which area do you think citizens can have a major impact to accelerate food system transformation? And here we're trying to build a word cloud. So please insert one or more words that you think are key. So which areas do you think citizens can have a major impact to accelerate food system transformation. All right. I see responses coming in. You can add more than one uh, word. So I see by local food choice. Um, I guess that Walter is actually water. Please keep adding your words. 
on which area do you think citizens can have a major impact to accelerate food system transformation? I see quite a bit of local food retail, consumption. I see that food, food choice and buy local are the largest. So I guess these are words that, that are appearing uh, more. All right, that, that's great. Um, I don't know if this, if this poll is going to remain open for some time or if it's going to close, uh, but I suggest we move, uh, we move forward with our, uh, with our panelists. So um, let's, uh, let's uh, jump into our uh, uh, panel session. So I'd like to remind the speakers that uh, they need to keep time. And to help them do that, I have made available my dinner bell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a little shake at, after five minutes, and then I'm going to give it a big shake after six minutes. So the first speaker I would like to invite is, uh, is Muki. So Muki, please turn on your camera and your, um, your speaker and or microphone, and please tell us about uh, your innovative approach to citizen science. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, DITOS, or Doing It Together Science, was a three-year project that uh, during this period we acted on the range of activities around citizen science and public engagement in science in order to make sure that, that we increase the number of people that are interested in the area of citizen science, reaching out to over 500,000 people and further 3 million people online. One of our speakers has been uh, cut off. Should we perhaps move to the second speaker then? Uh, Carlo, can I invite you to, to take the floor? Um, seeing, uh, and we'll, in the meantime, we'll try and get Muki uh, back on board. Um, Carlo, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Are you ready? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Could you please go ahead. <laughs> okay, many, many thanks. Um, as far as our, our experience at uh, Cariplo Foundation uh, in uh, uh, citizen engagement, it is important for us to, to say that uh, we started uh, a lot of years ago in 2015 through a participatory, a participatory process uh, engaging citizens in the decision making process of the development of the Milan food policy priorities for the for the five years on. So this was uh, not only a, 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 you know, a, not a formal uh, a step, but it was a step that was motivated by a, a res responsible research and innovation approach. Uh, the, the idea was to involve citizens in defining uh, the priorities. Then we started an activity in, uh, in the last four years uh, for uh, uh, involving citizens in the community of practices with the representative, a continuous uh, relationship with the stakeholders and citizens. This was very appreciated by the, um, our uh, Milanese citizens, our, uh, that were involved in uh, the uh, strategic definition of the uh, Milan food policies, for policy activities, dealing with uh, food catering, food, dealing with uh, uh, citizen involvement in uh, all the aspects related to food availability in our uh, town. So, uh, in uh, uh, an important step was also done during the, this 
pandemic period, the awful pandemic period, uh, with uh, the uh, development and participa active participation in what we call the Milan Talks. These were an initiative that we started in joint cooperation with the Milan municipality, the mayor of Milan, uh, as an idea of supporting a, a truly uh, engage uh, and exchange of practices and knowledge between citizens and uh, the, 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 the town, I mean, uh, in particular in this period of emergency. So, again, uh, we decided to go further and to involve citizens in community of practices and uh, uh, speak, uh, speak, uh, speak with an, an idea of involving them uh, uh, in, uh, in the particular critical aspects related to COVID uh, emergency and, and the pandemic. Uh, several aspects were touched, such as the, 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 most, the, the, the needs of the most fragile uh, people, uh, uh, for instance, the elderly people and the relationship with the food and, and so on. So uh, then uh, again, uh, the idea was to involve in university, to research centers, and to generate a, a, an open channel of dialogue uh, using uh, social media and dedicated tools in order to overcome physical barriers and distances. So uh, the, the uh, last point was, uh, I mean, I belong and I'm director of a foundation uh, where uh, and the role of foundation. The role of foundation was very, very important because we were a sort of activator uh, of the dialogue between citizens and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the, the, I mean, uh, the, the public, public authorities. And uh, the aspect was to uh, stress the point of independent, uh, not-for-profit organization in legitimizing guarantees a truly citizen engagement uh, and in the del deliberative process. So uh, again, this was an aspect that you, we uh, decided uh, to, to stress. The other aspect was to, through the activation of stakeholders, uh, to activate and to boost the, the uh, I mean, the, 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 the the scientific evidence of uh, uh, that could be an element for uh, boosting the, the citizen engagement, uh, providing them information in order to better participate uh, in the public debate. So that's it. Many thanks. Many thanks, uh, Carlo. You were very well <clears throat> disciplined. I didn't even get a chance to use my bell. <laughs> so. All right, uh, thanks for that. And uh, now, um, as uh, I don't know, Muki, are you um, are you online? Yes, I'm back. All right. Then shall <laughs> we go back to you? Uh, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, so I'll 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 try I'll do it without the slides. So uh, the doing it together science project, which was running until uh, 2019 for three years, was a large scale public engagement with uh, different activities in science and especially paying attention to citizen science. And one of the core ideas was to have a concept of an escalator where we think about the different ways in which people are engaged with science. It might be watching a television program, it might be going to a museum, such as the Science Museum or Natural History one, or uh, then it might be participating in an activity for one a day during the year, like a bio blitz or some other activity that is happening in their area. And they can get more engaged in deeper projects, such as going and observing um, birds every day or uh, engaging in a more detailed study all the way to creating their own biology projects using the abilities that now DIY biology allows people to, to do. And when you look across the range, you see that people are, uh, uh, 
less engaged, the more you are asking them. And that's expected. People have a lot of demands on their time. And the, we need to think about the different ways in which we can enable them to get involved. So one of the things that we've done uh, in DITOS was also to consider about who is missing from the picture. And even at the lower levels, when we're talking about the uh, active or passive consumption of science, we have a whole a lot groups, all groups in society who are not engaged. Um, some people that with uh, lower degrees of education or that uh, socioeconomic status that um, just mean that they are feeling that this type of activities are not for them. So within a DITOS project, we created the Science Bus, which was an activity where we had a, a van equipped with different scientific equipment and opportunities for people to run workshops, which went deliberately to remote places or places where usually you won't have citizen science activities. It was organized by the Work Society from Netherlands, And it went for different places and, and done a workshop. So for example, using an activity around food, such as yogurt uh, creation, in order to demonstrate to people how the science behind it work and get them more engaged in the scientific activity or creating a sunscreen and, and things like that. There was also activities around the use of DIY bio for domestic issues, such as checking what exactly going on in the meat that you are consuming as a way to engage, again, different groups in this activity. So it is offering a different ways in which we can consider how citizen science can involve a new groups. And food is one of the areas where there is a lot of interest across society and it provides us a lot of opportunities in this area. That's, that's my step. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Muki, you too have done a great job at keeping time and I haven't been able to use my bell. So. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks for that. Um, shall we, um, <clears throat> shall I invite Jacqueline then to, uh, to, uh, to speak? And I don't know, Jacqueline, do you have some slides that you would like yes, to show? I will share uh, my screen right. with this presentation and I hope it is visible now. And um, I, I'm sure, Karen, you will get an opportunity this time around to use your bell. I hope so. <laughs> I will do my best to keep it uh, to stay within time. Um, I will tell more about the Fit for Food 2030 project, uh, which is very much focusing on uh, food system transformation, that our food systems are currently unstable. Um, we are not completely happy with our current food system, basically because it is very much focused on producing high quantities of low priced foods from intensive large scale agricultural systems with high yielding varieties, breeds, large quantities of chemical inputs, use of water and a relatively fragmented supply chain. And that leads to some problems that we are experiencing today. And that's environmental pollution, climate change, water scarcity, losses and waste of food, as well as overweight and obesity on the consumer side. So we see all sorts of problems that we somehow are, have problems tackling at the moment. And at the same time, we feel that important um, values within our system are jeopardized. So the resilience, affordability, uh, to some extent, inclusiveness, biodiversity, health and welfare of both humans and animals and competitiveness are at stake. So th the system is not as we want it. Urgency for change. And COVID-19 is actually uh, acting as a magnifying glass. So COVID-19, we did an analysis within our project, how COVID-19 exacerbates some of the problems. And we see 
that the lockdowns, the travel restrictions, illness, loss of income and fear, uh, especially amongst consumers, lead to all sorts of disruptions and changes in preference in the food system. So we see reduced workforces, lowering production, um, uh, difficult accesses to inputs. We see disruptions at packaging, um, constrained transport to markets. Uh, we see changes in, in distribution patterns, more home delivery services, uh, but also, especially in the beginning, we saw empty shelves because the just-in-time system didn't work anymore but also changes in preferences at consumer end towards more and more packaged sh shelf stable goods all amongst others because of fear of safety issues um, constrained accessibility of food marketplaces less uh, having fresh food in some instances but also when schools close down children don't get uh, school meals anymore constrained affordability of food in some instances, but also more food waste, uh, dumping and burying of food because of loss of markets, uh, reduced demands. And in the center of the system, we see increased levels of inequality. And uh, find other financial problems, not so much at household level, but at the level of enterprises and government finances. So you see how COVID-19 disrupts the food system even more, showing that it also is also not so resilient to these kinds of shocks. Um, at the same time, the food system has an impact on COVID-19. Because of the diets, we see actually because of obesity, overnutrition and undernutrition, less functioning in immune systems with an increased susceptibility to infectious diseases, including COVID-19, but also increased severity. Uh, uh, intensive care and morbidity is often related to overweight and NCDs, which are again diet related. Um, also, industrial agriculture actually helps uh, diseases like COVID-19 emerge. It, we have more animal diseases, um, we have within an, uh, agriculture production an easier spread of diseases because of working conditions and migrant laborers and um, animals in crowded urban places where animal human spreading goes more easily. So if we want to prevent COVID-19, it things like this happening, it's also important to change our food system. So it only shows that there is more urgency. And research innovation can be a very important catalyst for these change processes. So this is the picture where Fit for, fit for Food uh, takes off from. And then how to change the diets, how to do this. Now, if you look at citizens, we see two competing ideologies. And in many cases, when citizens are addressed in food system change, they are viewed as consumers. They are the ones that are not eating healthy. They are the ones that are not concerned with sustainability. And what is often said, we need to educate the public because they don't know enough about it. They don't care enough about it. There should be information transfer. Um, and that is very much from the idea of the deficit model. So we need to, ex we need to fill citizens with more scientific expertise, rather top down and uh, knowledge is context free. The competing ideology nowadays is much more the dialogue where we acknowledge there is different forms of expertise. Citizens are also to some extent experts and we need to go more to deliberation. But I want to contest that just dialogue is not enough because it doesn't generate, it's not necessarily um, uh, relates to decision making. It, it, people are allowed to talk but and to say something, but are they really having a seat at the table at the decision making? And what happens after the dialogue? Is there any action? Dialogues are known for lack of follow up. So within Fit for Food, we really want to add to this one a third way. And that is that we really need to work together. Um, acknowledge that uh, food system transformation is extremely complex, that it 
works at different levels, not only at the individual, but also the interpersonal, organizational, community and the policy level, that these all interact with one another, that citizens are just as important as any other stakeholder in this, and not only as consumers, but also as co-producers citizens also come up with new ideas innovations i things of how what they can do how they can set up community organizations set up small businesses uh, so for us citizens engagement is not only providing information which is of course important not only having dialogues but also very much this issue of co-creation and we do that in uh, labs at different levels we have the labs at policy level where it's really about decision making on research and innovation agenda setting and we have 11 policy levels uh, labs across europe we also have 14 city labs and that's established at really at the level of the city but also the region so not only the the, the cities the urban areas and what we do is um we um actually analyze together with citizens the food system how do they perceive it so we help them also to think in in food systems ideas so in this holistic way uh, with citizens we do visioning exercises of where do you want to go to what would an ideal food system look like for you what is sustainability in your um, uh, from your perception um, action plan what can we do together um, and uh, so we do that in workshop with just citizens and there are two examples here of of city labs in amsterdam and athens where we do this separately with citizens but we also do it in mixed workshops and the city labs and policy labs are coordinated by lab coordinators uh, and lab coordinators are from existing institutions at, at policy lab level they are from often from ministries um, uh, but and from city lab level they're often science museums or science centers but can also be uh, science um, shops from universities and they are really being trained in all sorts of methods and tools to engage with citizens to engage with different stakeholders and to do these kinds of uh, workshops with them and as fit for food we have developed uh, what we call a knowledge hub and i will give that link as well where all these different tools and methods are collected and made available to a wide range of stakeholders who might want to follow up on the methods of these labs or any other activities that we did within the project and karen i'm done <laughs> fantastic <laughs> thank you thank you so much i think could you please stop sharing your yes screen? i will oops yeah now it should work yeah it does All right oh great thank you very much and uh <laughs> Um, I suggest now uh, we we move to our to keep time that we move to our first <coughs> Slido poll. So in Slido, you have to you have a choice of Q and A or polls. Please go to the polls, and uh, and the question is: so which of these, according to you, have the greatest potential to engage citizens to transform food systems? So it's a multiple choice. And the first is citizen science to gather or provide data, policy labs for visioning and agenda setting, living labs to foster co-creation of local solutions, participatory research involving citizens in research and innovation projects, or um, support for social innovation. So which of these is, is do you think is, has the greatest potential um to uh, to assist in uh in uh, citizen food transformation so i'm gonna i'm gonna vote too let's see there we go ha. so what do we have here 
I see that half of you are responding to the to the living labs. Um, I guess that means there's a real interest in coming together and getting your hands dirty to really um, come up with something that works on the ground and locally. The second is support for social innovation, uh, participatory research, then policy labs, and then citizen science to, to gather data. Interesting. Um, I'd like to um, I'd like to now ask uh, some of our uh, panelists um, if they'd like to just uh, shortly comment on any uh, of these findings. Unfortunately, because the um, the Slido oh the Slido's gone now. Okay, very good. Now I can see the chat again. So if if uh, if some of the panelists would like to take the floor and just feedback on some of these findings. We have a couple of minutes to take your your feedback. Um, so you either kind of raise your hand uh, so I can see it, or or type in the chat. So I see that Muki is is waving. So Muki, please come on just, in and just, comment just uh, on on this uh, first poll. So citizen science, just to note, it much more than just data collection, and uh, it can involve actually part of different scenarios where people also design their own experiments and ask the question and influence the whole research process. Process, So that's something to be aware of that can change and link to the other types of activity. Okay, very good. Good point, indeed. Uh, would anyone else like to come in? Mm -hmm. Christian? Yeah, I would just like to comment that I, of course, think it's, it's a very positive result that, uh, that the Living Labs and the co-creation is in, in the focus. Uh, I would very much agree on, on this being uh, extremely important. All right. Would anyone else like to say anything? Yes, Jacqueline. Um, I think indeed the living labs have a lot to offer because they actually uh, can be co-analysis, they can include citizen science, um, they can have co-creation, but what is lacking in the living labs is often the policy link. And um, when we see transformation happening is actually when top down and bottom up come together as a kind of squeeze, let's say. So I would like to make a case for also very much linking the living labs to the to the policy level. Excellent, and, uh, excellent point. Thank you. Anyone else? I can just say that I agree very much with Jacqueline on that, and, and we're also aiming to do that in our uh, Food Shift uh, 2030 project. Excellent. Uh, thanks. All right. If there's no further uh, hands waving. Oh, yes, Carlo, go ahead. Um, uh, an important point that was raised by uh, Jacqueline uh, is to demonstrate uh, the, the true engagement of citizens in order to show as a part of accountability, their, uh, I mean, uh, uh, that their role uh, is taken into account by policymakers. I, I think that this point could be really uh, an important point to work with. Thank you, thank you. All right, if there's no further hand waving, then I suggest we, we go to the next round of, of speakers. So again, uh, same rule, six minutes each. And I'll give you a little ding after five minutes and then a big ding after six. Uh, Deano, I think you're, you're up next. Would you like to share your screen to show some slides? Sure. Um, okay. Um, hopefully you can see the slide and hear me as well. Yes, we can. Um, thank you. Um, thanks, Karen. And um, it's it's. I'm really excited to be here with you this morning. Um, so the existing food system undermines our health and the health of our family, the environment, and our planet. To turn the tide and create a sustainable food system, demand immense transformations at the personal and societal level, which can be overwhelming. Most research and practical work around food security and the, food, the future of our food tend to focus on the visible aspects of food. For example, the advocate for technical or behavioral approaches to bring about societal change. 
Yet, technical innovations alone cannot bring about the societal changes needed. Similarly, the effort to change food habits and behaviours has clearly not worked so far. These approaches rely on the attribution of people's food choices to a lack of understanding of its health implications or the environmental impact of that food. And it tries to remedy the situation by providing information or using nudging to move people towards the right choices. As we heard already, this is known as a deficit model and it's oversimplistic because it fails to acknowledge the complex relationship between knowledge, behavior, attitudes and values. Most importantly, it fails to acknowledge that knowledge, behavior, attitudes and values develop in specific cultural and social contexts and they gain their meaning and relevance in those contexts. Social and cultural contexts are the glue that assign particular meaning and link the tangible and intangible aspects of food that transform it into food heritage. However, food heritage is largely invisible. Here, I see a basket full of herbs on the right, while on the left, an apple orchard, and in the middle, there's a slice of tiramisu, my favorite dessert. The reason you cannot see them is that they're all drawn in white. Isn't it interesting how we cannot see things when the context they're surrounded by is invisible? The participatory work we did through the Big Picnic project made the role of food as cultural heritage visible. We found that people from different countries and walks of life know that food diversity expresses cultural diversity and it's key to health diets. They also appreciate that the cultural diversity of food depends on biodiversity, that cultural survival depends on biodiversity. Part of the reason for this is the performative nature of food making and food sharing. Another factor is that our knowledge about food is based on mundane, everyday activities, such as shopping for food, or it's based on everyday interactions and routines, such as sharing meals with family and friends. To make people's vernacular knowledge of food heritage and the value system that is associated with it visible, the Big Picnic Project set up a series of co-creation sessions that encourage discussion about how people in different countries and in social groups understand and interpret food security. These sessions included foraging for food, food making and sharing, and telling food stories. The inclusion of these performative aspects of food in the co-creation sessions made visible how food fits in people's everyday life, how food choices reflect food heritage and affirm community values. So we have a, if I have one key message to communicate to you today, that would be that any food policy needs to acknowledge that it's the essential role that heritage plays in people's relationship with food and food practices. And this is more important now than ever, as COVID-19 has forced us all to reevaluate our lives and what we value the most. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teana, also for, for keeping the time and for the slides. Um, I'd like to remind the uh, participants that drew the uh, Zoom uh, Q and A, um, we I'm um, I'd be happy uh, to invite the, the the speakers to eventually 
reply to some of this, these, these questions if, if, if possible. Um, otherwise, we will, we will look into your comments uh, and suggestions after, after the event uh, to help us um, uh, draft recommendations that, that can come out of the session. Um, so now we're going to move on to our, um, our last speaker. So Christian, uh, your project kicked off just before the COVID pandemic burst. Um, how was your experience of citizen empowerment? How has it been so far? I don't know if you'd like to share slides. If so, please activate them. Thank you. Yes, I will do so. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. I'll just see and share my slides here. Um, can you see the slides? Yes, perfect. Okay. Very good. So I'm going to talk about the Food Shift uh, 2030 project. Uh, the overall objective of this project is actually to foster a, a food system a transition towards a, a low carbon circular uh, future. And we're actually doing this by supporting uh, the transformative power of, of citizens that are already engaged or have the potential to be, uh, become engaged in uh, co-developing uh, sustainable food system solutions and, and co-creating our, our food, future food system. So uh, we are doing this uh, by really focusing on citizen empowerment. Citizen empowerment is the cornerstone of the project. And throughout the Food Shift 2030 project, we are focusing on, on empowering citizens, also including vulnerable citizens and uh, vulnerable groups and making it easier for them to make uh, informed decisions about their own uh, food consumption, engaging in, in food related grassroots movements and NGOs, building their own uh, food startups, uh, finding jobs in the food sector and also influence their food policy uh, and the way the food is produced and, and distributed. We're doing this by establishing uh, open innovation uh, living labs uh, in uh, nine European uh, city regions. And these uh, living labs, they are featuring uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration between uh, key stakeholders from both uh, private companies, the local gov uh, government, so we have the policy included, the research institutions, and then the civil society, including uh, the citizens. So as you can see from this uh, infographic, then uh, these living labs, the so-called food shift accelerator labs, they are at the very uh, core of the project. And, and furthermore, we have an impact uh, pathway, a dedicated impact pathway on, on citizen empowerment, which is uh, kind of making sure that citizen empowerment is embedded throughout the, the project from establishing the living labs in work package one, accelerating the solutions in work package two, also contributing to monitoring as, and assessing the benefits in work package three, uh, governing the transition, making the sustainable food system policies at the city region uh, level, multiplying the impact in work package five, where we are establishing an additional 27 uh, food shift uh, enabler labs. So, so citizen empowerment is, is really crucial here, as well as also citizen-driven innovation. As you can see from the cogwheel here, it is really the citizen-driven innovation that, that drives uh, the food system transformation. So, so what do we mean by uh, citizen-driven innovation and citizen-driven food systems? As stated in, in this presentation by our innovation manager, uh, Dirk Washer and Martin uh, Krivitz at our recent uh, food shift uh, webinar on shaking up the food system that uh, is available online here, citizen driven food systems are considered as models for a democracy of space, people and knowledge, ensuring transparency and control over food security, safety and, and quality. So what we are trying to do is that this engagement is then taking place in, in our city regions through the development uh, of uh, a food uh, citizenship. So uh, what we need to do is we need to move away from uh, identifying ourselves as consumers, as, as also Jacqueline mentioned, towards a sense actually of food citizenship. So, and what is that? This is that we should have a citizen mindset by shifting the way we think of ourselves towards a citizen mindset. Mindset, we can unlock our ability to influence and steer the food system towards one that is more fair and resilient for all, both for the people, uh, the animals and uh, the planet. And as food citizens, we actually uh, participate in the food system. We feel engaged, empowered to do something about that uh, in that system. 
and and that is why we do it. We help to produce food, we help to organize logistics and uh, distribution, and we help to create an environment that we want to live in. And and this engagement is is taking place in our city regions through, for example, the development of a food policy council and a food hub uh, in Berlin. Uh, through the establishment of an agricultural park and uh, food gardens in Rochlav and Ostende, in uh, composting projects that we have in, in Bari, and also in Athens by empowering school children to reflect on their own uh, dietary uh, habits. So uh, furthermore, citizens have also been engaged in providing support uh, for the highly challenged uh, food sector companies and food sector workers during COVID-19. We have in fact uh, established a, um, a COVID-19 task force also led by our innovation manager, Doug Washer. And we have seen, for example, here in Barcelona that uh, citizens have contributed with 3D printing of personal protective equipment for food sector workers. We have uh, seen in the Greater Copenhagen direct food delivery from urban restaurants, bars and cafes to consumers. And we have seen provision of food for elderly and homeless in collaboration with a food bank. And uh, finally, we have also seen in Athens free food distribution to vulnerable, vulnerable groups. So uh, if you are more interested in, in reading about how we are developing these labs, we have already our deliverables out on the website on, on guidelines for establishing the labs and also uh, a, a actually a knowledge uh, exchange framework. And uh, you can read more about the website and the labs, of course, at our website and, uh, you know, different uh, social uh, media channels. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. And so that uh, wraps up our, our presentations uh, for today. Um, we do have another Slido question that is, uh, that is open for, for the audience. And, uh, and so we'll, we can jump to that. So please uh, go back to your Slido. Um, the question is, what could be more impactful in boosting the engagement of citizens in science for food system transformation? So the choices are the following increase of how amongst researchers, increase of know-how amongst researchers to engage with citizens, that's option one. Option two is increase of support from local administrations and universities to engage with citizens. The next option is to increase uh, the scientific recognition of, for participatory and transdisciplinary research and innovation. The next option is more calls for proposals soliciting citizen engagement. And the last one is more outreach to citizens on the benefits of engaging in science. So please uh, submit your uh, preferred um, choice on what could be more impactful in boosting the engagement of citizens in science for food system transformation. I think I'm gonna vote too. So I see now that uh, <clears throat> it looks like more funds to bring citizens on board. That seems to be the top one, followed by increasing support from administrations and universities to engage with citizens. Then increased recognition for this kind of research. All right. Um, I think I, I'm at this point. I can uh, I pass the floor to uh, to some of our experts here online. Uh, the speakers, would you like to come in and and just comment on on these findings? Who would like to go first, please? I think the method of waving your hand is is the best one. Teano, please. So thank you. Um, it's interesting, and I, I, I hate to be one of those academics that says it depends. Um, I think that all of those things are really useful. So um, because my, my background is in museums and heritage sites, um, I think that all those institutions have different 
types of citizens and all kind of target citizens in, in mind. And probably it, it's the networks that we need to develop and work together to get to those different audiences and do all of those things, um, not just one of them. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to come in? Carlo, go ahead. Uh, I really appreciate this slide though, because uh, I mean, uh, provides us a picture that is interesting. Well, I think that one of the most important issues is how citizens get on board, which role they could play uh, within uh, uh, these uh, challenges. And uh, for me, it's uh, a critical aspect because uh, um, I think that we have also to consider an inclusive way. Perhaps I link also the aspect with more call for proposal, for, say, for instance, involving and giving voices to the most fragile people. This is a key aspect. Otherwise, we will have, uh, you know, sounds uh, uh, only from the more structured issues. And it's uh, this participation, how is also a matter of exchanging methods. It's important that uh, through this, uh, within this way, we, we can boost, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, methods uh, in order to build trust in science that the citizens contribute to to uh, to uh, to grow. So, uh, for me, this is the the, the key aspect. Thank you. Uh, Christian, go ahead. I, I would say also a key aspect is, is actually that, that the, the researchers who really know how to engage uh, citizens, they need to talk with the other researchers and as well as the policymakers and the local administrations, because what we see sometimes in the municipalities is, is of course the case that yes, citizen participation is kind of obligatory. So you, you are making hearings, but to really get the citizen involved in a, in a co-creation process uh, needs a, a completely different uh, approach. So, so I think, and this needs somehow to be communicated and, and we need to have actually also the local administrators take, uh, take uh, courses and workshops on participatory learning and action so they can learn how actually to involve uh, the citizens more in the co-creation. Would anyone else like to come in? Yes, Muki. So I would see them linked to each other. I, and it's unfortunate true that for a people in university and for scientists in general, the signal that they get through the funding system is about the values of what they need to pay attention to. And as long as we're seeing things like swaths at the edges of Horizon 2020 in terms of the size of funding and it calls for a more inclusion, but not demands for that. So in Horizon Europe, we are seeing calls for citizen science to be included in something like a cross-cutting theme. And that would lead to the culture change. So we need a major culture change within how research is being conducted and what universities value all the other. So that's why I think the funding is quite critical because the rest will come after it. Jacqueline, would you like to add uh, your thoughts to this part or I don't know if I missed any hand waving so no, the only problem is that if you also have the Q&A and there was a very relevant question being asked and I was typing away, I realized that multitasking is not only difficult for men, but also for women. So I must say, uh, uh, I have to skip this one. I need to get my head around it. <laughs> okay, no, no worries. Let's see. We have another six minutes. Um, so before we, we close, I'd like to ask uh, our, our speakers, is there any, you know, what's the one take home message? Uh, if, if you, what's the one thing you would like to say to our participants about, you know, some, either something you've already said that you think needs to be uh, stressed uh, because it's really the, the, the point you, you, you want to bring forward, or is it something, maybe some, somebody else spoke about? Is it something that the participants wrote in the, in the Q&A? What is that one thing that you would like to, you know, underline with a yellow highlighter that could be a take home message for today? Who'd like to go first? Carlo. Thank you. 
Um, I mean, just one more uh -huh. beat. Uh, here am I. Uh, sorry. Uh, can you listen me? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Just one more beat. Uh, uh, it's it's as far as citizen engagement is not just a matter of uh, 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 how we engage citizens, but also when. Uh, it's it's really important that. Uh, and I see in some mainstreaming uh, citizen engagement projects that they are engaged uh, later when they when the options as, as already defined. So a truly citizen engagement means engage since the beginning. And this is important mm -hmm. from my point of view. The last point is that we have through these approaches the opportunity of boosting and uh, uh, trust in science, which actually is more a, a very important issue where we have to talk about issues, problems, but based on data evidence. This is important. This is the key challenge we have in our hands as a commu scientific community. Thank you. Excellent points. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Yes, Deano. Yeah, I think to, to, to follow on from what um, um, Carlos said, I think it's important to, especially now that COVID has made us all to reevaluate life and the purpose of life, science, art, and so on. I think it's important to um, think about those boundaries and kind of start re um, resolving the, the boundaries between canonical science and vernacular knowledge about science and think more about that knowledge that people bring with them rather than from an institution or scientific point of view um, kind of make that bridge but be willing to make that bridge and really you know reach out to people from their point of view thanks thanks very much we need to wrap up so please keep your interventions brief yes christian yeah i would say i think it, it is very important that we need to move away from this narrative of of people and and citizens in, in in the cities being consumers because this is actually negatively affecting the way we perceive ourselves then we start more and more perceiving ourselves as consumers we actually start to consume more so we really do need to perceive ourselves as citizens and food citizens and instead of just being heard you know in participatory processes we need to be involved everybody in a co-creation of the future food system thank you uh, who would like to go? Muki, go ahead. Yeah, so something that, that came up in, in both the talks of uh, Fiano and, and Jacqueline um, came up the deficit model and it's kind of something to reflect on about how how is it that we are 30 years plus talking about the deficit model and it's still popping up for scientists every single time. So we need to kind of move beyond that. But what is it that we need to educate? And who is it that we need to educate to get Thank over you. it? Thank you. Jacqueline? Yeah, I would really like to follow up on that because also in the Fit for Food project, working with research and innovation, we came across exactly this. And, and um, it, of course, has to do with the education of uh, researchers, but also other stakeholders, professionals. As soon as we become professionals, we suddenly think that non-professionals are uh, in deficit uh, of knowledge um, and, and, and don't have experiential knowledge or of values uh, in, engaged. I once uh, um, suggested to Karen, we need your bell. We need to ring it every time that this deficit model is being uh, voiced. And I mean, say, what? No, <laughs> stop. <laughs> there, there we have it again. Right, I have to ring it now because I see <laughs> in the chat for panelists that we need to wrap up. So thank you so, so much to the panelists, to everyone in the back office, because this is a real collective effort to make this work. And to all the participants that have followed us today, um, to conclude this session, we're going to uh, show you two small videos, which will take six minutes of your time. So please stay connected to see the videos and many, many thanks. And don't forget to take part in other sessions. This, this week long citizen engagement process festival has really been a, a wonderful and timely exercise. So enjoy. Take care, be safe, and thanks to all.
Why do we need an urban food strategy? The global food system is not able to secure to all people a diet which is healthy, sustainable and fair for producers. For these reasons, in the last years, many cities all around the world adopted two innovative mechanisms, food plans and food councils. In 2017, the municipality of Livorno decided to develop its own food strategy, including a food plan and a food council. The Tuscany region, through its regional law and participation, financed Salute, the Livorno Food Strategy Project, with an agreement in which the municipality made the commitment to adopt the decision taken by citizens. How has Salute been achieved? The deliberative process has been structured in two phases, information and engagement, policy and decision making. The policy and decision making is divided in three distinct moments. Firstly, learning, policy making and decision making by citizens. Secondly, adoption, decision making by citizens and development of an integrated food policy by local government. And finally, signing of food citizenship pact. Experts from other cities were invited to present the topic that will be discussed during the meetings. The topics presented by the experts were the following. Sustainable diet, school meals and food education, food and local development, sustainable agriculture and food supply chains, food waste and food poverty. Citizens were organised in small groups to discuss the main food issues in Livorno and to identify solutions. Document development. The group of experts leading the deliberative process developed two documents. One, the food plan of Livorno. Two, the food council of Livorno model. The two documents were discussed in three following meetings where citizens took decisions over their food plans and food council. The local government adopted the food plan and food council proposals and developed the integrated food policy. For each area of local government, concrete actions were identified for implementing the food plan and the executive body made a commitment to institutionalise the food council. Citizens and the deputy mayor signed the Food Citizenship Pact, where the local government made a commitment to incorporate the right to food within the statute of the municipality. The municipality of Livorno is the first local government to have institutionalised a deliberative food democracy, institutionalised a food council, institutionalised an integrated food policy, and put the right to food in the statute of the municipality as a result of the food strategy deliberative process. De EU doet te weinig aan duurzaamheid. Um, <laughs> het is echt een moeilijke. <laughs> where to start? Hmm, where to start? Ja, ik vind het ook eigenlijk niet zo goed. Ja, we kunnen er wel meer aan doen, denk ik, toch? We zijn uh, vlaggetjes aan het uh, repareren. Een beetje Europa aan het herstellen. Europa aan het herstellen. Bureau EU is een artistieke sociale interventie die als een pop-up bureau landt op allerlei plekken om het gesprek aan te gaan over Europa en daaraan gelinkte maatschappelijke thema's. We doen dit nu drie jaar in allerlei verschillende steden door Nederland. Dit jaar hebben we heel veel jongeren gesproken en met name gevraagd over hoe zij kijken naar klimaat en klimaatverandering. Maken ze zich zorgen? Gaat het langs ze heen? Uh, of zijn ze er juist heel uh, betrokken op? Uiteindelijk moet het uit zichzelf komen. Kijk, de politiek kan even laten een aantal regeltjes doorvoeren met bijvoorbeeld uh, betalen voor een plastic zakje. Uh, dat zijn uh, wel goede dingen, denk ik. Ik vind het belangrijk om uh, stem te geven aan alle soorten verhalen en meningen die er zijn. Uh, de dialoog tussen hen bevorderen en bewustwording creëren. En mensen te bereiken op deze manier die anders uh, niet snel inspraak zouden leveren in formele processen. Als ik minister van duurzaamheid zou zijn, dan? Zou ik denk ik als eerste een tax op vlees doen, want nou ja, vlees is natuurlijk heel schadelijk voor het milieu. Duurzame landbouw, circulaire landbouw, uh, plasticvrije winkels. Maar wat wel een uitdaging is, is um, dat veel mensen of er gewoon niet veel over weten over Europa, of, of ook niet het vertrouwen hebben dat ze er echt iets aan zouden kunnen veranderen. Om heel eerlijk te zijn, hou ik me niet echt bezig met politiek. Vind ik niet heel interessant. Het is heel belangrijk dat we all put an input into like an environment, but I don't feel that I can make a change. 
Dus ik hoop dat we juist door die gesprekken uh, wel mensen aan het denken hierover zetten. Uh, we hebben dan prachtige verhalen en meningen opgehaald. We laten ook zien wat er speelt. En de vraag is hoe we daar goed de vertaling kunnen leggen uh, naar beleidsmakers. Ideaal zou zijn dat natuurlijk alles 100% groen is. Dat ik gewoon zie dat de wereld een beetje aan het vergaan is. En dat ik in die wereld moet opgroeien. En mijn kinderen en kleinkinderen ook. Dat vind ik gewoon echt heel erg eigenlijk. Dus ja, dat probeer ik zelf. Daar probeer ik ook iets aan te doen. Dit jaar hebben we specifiek rond klimaatvraagstukken. Dus heel veel jongeren bereikt. En daar zit denk ik wel de kracht van Bureau EU. Dat we echt naar de jongeren toe zijn gegaan.